Hello all, thanks for joining. I'm Jacob Henry Leviton, Program Coordinator of the Institute for Humanities Research here at Arizona State University. And it's my sincere pleasure to welcome you to this afternoon's talk featuring Dr. Victoria rizzo lynchon Briefly, I wanted to introduce some of our remaining uh, spring events, which will all take place in a Zoom hybrid format for those of you who happen to be joining today from outside the Phoenix area. This Monday at 3 p.m. Arizona time, the IHR will be hosting the critical theorists Karen Barad and Vicki Kirby for an event and conversation around the theme of what happens when humanities meet science. Then on May 5th, we'll have uh, Alan Thomas, editorial director of the University of Chicago Press, and WJT Mitchell, Gaylord Donnelly, distinguished service professor at the University of Chicago, joined by Devaney Lozer, Regents Professor of English and Global Sports Scholar at ASU in conversation on university press publishing and interdisciplinary journals. And then finally, on May 6th, Professor Mitchell will be giving a talk at the IHR on the theme of iconology, visual culture, and media aesthetics. As ever, uh, for more information on our initiatives and events, visit our website, ihr.asu.edu. And I'll uh, be leaving uh, the URL um, in the chat as well. So without further ado, I'm delighted to introduce today's speaker, Victoria rizzo -Lenchen. Dr. rizzo -Lenchen is postdoctoral scholar at Arizona State University, where she currently serves as the ACLS Emerging Voices Fellow at the IHR. Dr. rizzo -Lenchen earned her PhD in German and Scandinavian studies with graduate certificates in women, gender, and sexuality studies, as well as film studies from the University of Massachusetts Amherst. Her writings have appeared in, among other venues, Gender and Sexuality in Eastern German Film and Comrades of Color, East Germany in the Cold War World. Now, while I always enjoy introductions, today's has special meaning precisely because Dr. rizzo Lenchen has been such an inimitable and energizing presence at the IHR. Dr. rizzo Lenchen has contributed her unique ability to combine work across public facing scholarship and the design of rich programming, the IHR that has featured leading creative practitioners working at the vanguard of contemporary cinema. Dr. rizzo Lenchen's own research interests focus on GDR cinema, film studies, star studies, and women and gender, women, gender, and sexuality studies. And she is currently engaged in a multimedia environmental humanities project that looks at grassroots mobilization around the environmental crisis in East Germany and how it was bolstered uh, and how it was bolstered by that looks at, sorry, grassroots mobilization around the environmental crisis in East Germany and how it was bolstered by the exchange of ideas, media, and the flow of people across the East-West German border. As such, Dr. rizzo Lenchen's newest scholarship, as I've come to understand it, holds out the promise of a decisive intervention that demonstrates that it is impossible to understand the foremost environmental issues of our time without recourse to thinking about the many ecological rifts that formed in East Germany in the 1970s and the 1980s. Please join me in welcoming Dr. rizzo Lenchen for her talk, Environmental Crisis and Recovery in East Germany, Lessons from the Past. Thank you, um, Jake, for the introduction. And good afternoon and everyone, and thank you uh, for being here. I would also like to thank the Institute for Humanities Research at Arizona State University and the ACLS for all the generous support that I have received for this fellowship this year. Um, and I also want to send out a special thank you to Ron Borlio, who has been my mentor this year, who has listened and talked and met, made suggestions and provided insight as the project developed. Uh, before I begin, I would like to start with a land acknowledgement. I would respectfully like to acknowledge that I am working and residing in Longmeadow, Massachusetts. Longmeadow was established on the homelands of the Algonquian inhabitants, known in this ter territory by the tribal name Agawam. 
The Agawam people were also part of the Pocomtuck Nation, which extends along the present day Connecticut River. I recognize the long historical connection the Pocomtuck Nation has with these lands and waters, dating back millennia before their communities were decimated and displaced through European colonization, and which has continued as their tribal homelands have been made part of the United States. As an active first step to foster understanding and to support efforts to resist the erasure of indigenous culture, history, and communities through over 400 years of colonization and displacement, I share this statement with you today. Thank you. Okay, before I begin the talk, I would like to share um, a short animation with you from the Easterman Studios. And midway through the talk, I'll um, share another one. So I'm going to go ahead and start that before I bring in my PowerPoint. Okay. Give me one second. Wait. Sorry, I didn't push um, share sound. Okay, sir. Okay, and my talk, Environmental Crisis and Recovery in Eastern Germany, Lessons from the Past. Things have come full circle. The emissions from the industrial plant that produces gas masks are so severe that people and pets can't live without a gas mask. The satirical commentary is from a 1989 three minute film by one of East Germany's most successful animators, Klaus Georgi. Such dire conditions are maintained by the monotonous mechanical sounds of assembly production that serve as an auditory backdrop to abject life everywhere. Full Circle's critique of the GDR's reckless industrial practices and how inure society had become to an increasingly uninhabitable world was a follow-up to Georgi's 1986 short film, Consequence, which is what we just watched. Here, trees are suffocating and forests are dying. Birds are losing their feathers and falling from the sky and humans everywhere are choking on their own pollution. <laughs> 
In both films, humans continue to go about their daily lives, driving to and from work, reading newspapers, and buying ice cream cones. The films depict society's problems at the heart of environmental challenges, both then and now, a seeming contradiction between progressive climate action and fiscal planning and the overwhelming feeling of one's own incapacity to change things that are culturally, economically, and ideologically entrenched. By the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989 and subsequent German reunification one year later, a period known as the Wende or transition, the country's centuries old forests were dying and East Germans were themselves ill from the adverse effects of an unabated socialist plan economy. Eastern Germany today, however, looks much different. Climate journalist Umir Erfan has reported that Germany's CO2 emissions fell 15% after reunification. And in Eastern Germany, industrial sector emissions fell by 43%. This is due, he reports, in large part to, quote, shuttered factories, decommissioned fossil fuel plants, increasing renewable energy penetration, efficiency upgrades, and a declining population, end quote. Since reunification, Germany has continued efforts to heal the land and reduce its national carbon footprint through land reclamation, sustainability efforts, retrofitting fossil fuel plants, and an aggressive turn toward renewable energy, what is called Germany's Energiewende or an energy transition. It is a plan to transition the country's energy production and consumption to a renewable energy-based economy and phase out nuclear and fossil fuel energy by 2050. Such changes certainly come with a hefty price tag and with some debate about its efficacy. But perhaps one of the most significant success stories is that the majority of Germans support the country's aggressive climate policies and responsible environmental habits and practices have become a part of the country's self-identity. The story of crisis is therefore also a story of recovery in Eastern Germany. And it positions contemporary Germany well to face the current climate crisis. The history behind Germany's ambitious benchmark for 2050 represents some of the Western world's most bold policy proposals for combating climate change. In this talk, I will first give a brief history of the environmental crisis in East Germany and the grassroots mobilization that ensued before turning to an overview of the key issues and findings about Germ contemporary Germany's current climate policies. Finally, I will consider the threads that I find in this story of crisis and recovery and conclude with some lessons learned. By 1989, roughly 40% of East Germany's land and water were contaminated. Chemical plants operating with outmoded equipment had been discarding untreated chemical waste into waterways and soil for decades. Large power plants burning lignite, more commonly known as brown coal, were emitting high levels of sulfur dioxide and soot into the atmosphere, an estimated 5.6 million tons annually. The acid rain caused by emissions from coal, cement, and other industrial plants killed forests and lakes and dumped toxic levels of heavy metals and acids into the soil poisoning plants, animals, and humans in the GDR's heavily industrialized sectors. Unstable nuclear power plants added to growing social anxieties around nuclear power and nuclear war, especially after the disaster at Chernobyl in 1986. Brown coal mining was inexpensive, inexpensive and provided 70% of the country's energy, but the increasing demand for the expanding field of open pit coal mining also caused deforestation and it displaced villages and wrecked people's connections to the land and their communities. Buildings and homes were blackened inside and out with soot and dust, soot and dust, and numerous physiological and mental health issues were on the rise, such as depression, alcoholism, chronic respiratory diseases, cancer, and infant mortality. These health crises were obvious to anyone living in these sectors and increasingly activists found innovative if not risky ways to expose them. Western journalists reporting in the East also covered the growing crisis, most notably Peter Wenzierski, who had worked as a travel correspondent in East Germany for the Evangelical Press Service in the early part of the 1980s. 
His novel about the GDR's environmental crisis, Nothing Grows from Top to Bottom, was published in 1986 in West Germany and included statistics about pollution levels, analyses of policy and practice, prognoses for the future, and anonymous testimonies by East German citizens who were suffering from toxic levels of pollutants. One person from the Ore Mountains near the Czech border described their fears, and I will share an extended section of their testimony here. It scares me when I learn that stud this is a quote, sorry, quote, it scares me when I learn that studies on children in the neighboring Most district in Czechoslovakia have shown that their level of development is clearly lagging behind that of their peers from other areas. It scares me when I learn that DDT pesticide is suddenly going to be used again in our forests. It scares me when I know that I shouldn't really be eating the fruit that we harvest because it contains such a high percentage of harmful substances. It scares me when we see that depression is on the rise for this population. It scares me when the people in charge keep concealing the truth from us, we, when we are not told any of the statistical data. I believe we are quite mature enough to know the truth. It scares me when I see that in the meantime, protest and indignation have often turned into resignation among the people. You can feel the sadness everywhere, the helplessness, the apparent powerlessness when hope is needed. The people from the Ore Mountains who have been joined with nature since time immemorial are ill, not only in body, but in spirit." End quote. Known as the Black Triangle, the Ore Mountains were part of an industrial sector that straddled the East German, Polish, and Czech borders, and which was one of Europe's most polluted territories. It signifies the absolute failure of environmental policy as it gave way to a socialist planned economy in East Bloc countries. While the 1949 draft of East Germany's constitution ensured land reform and the redistribution of natural resources to public ownership, a 1968 revision included reconsiderations of land exploitation. It stated that the country's natural resources, quote, must also be protected and used efficiently, end quote, and that nature conservation was, quote, in the interests of the well being of the citizens, end quote and was the responsibility of both the state and the people. While the early draft demonstrates the ideological foundation of the country and its efforts to establish a socialist economic system, the 1968 revision recognizes the limitations of avaricious land exploitation for long-term planning and overall growth. It is also an attempt to redress a contradiction between the country's developing ecological crisis and its ideological assertion that such levels of environmental damage must be the result of, quote, profit-driven capitalism, end quote. In 1970, East Germany passed the Act for the Planned Management of Socialist Land Improvement to control pollution of land, air, and water, but again, to little effect. These steps, as ineffective as they were, show that the state was aware of the growing crisis, but they also demonstrate the antagonistic relationship between the two German states in particular, and between the East Bloc and Western countries in general during the global Cold War. West German Chancellor Konrad Adenauer's policies to isolate East Germany left the country struggling since its inception for international and domestic recognition of its sovereignty and its right to exist. After Erich Honecker's rise to power in 1971, he and West German Chancellor Willy Brandt cooperated on stabilizing relations between the two German states. And Honecker's administration also made significant efforts to join the international community outside of the Soviet bloc. International events, therefore, also resulted in climate policy in East Germany, especially in the 1970s. An early precursor, however, was the 1955 UN International Conference on the Peaceful Use of Atomic Energy. By joining, East Germany adopted its peaceful mission. With the Soviet Union's blessing and supervision, the GDR was eager to develop nuclear power to showcase socialism's technological advantage and to open the Office for Nuclear Research and Nuclear Technology that same year. In 1957, it announced an ambitious plan in the state-run newspaper Neues Deutschland that the GDR would develop 20 nuclear plant power plants and the, 
and the East German state began a public campaign to assuage public uncertainty, uncertainties of the benefits and security of using nuclear power. The first two nuclear power plants were online by 1974, but both experienced problems and near disasters, leading the GDR to treat information about nuclear power and uranium mining as highly sensitive, and no further nuclear power plants were built. In 1972, the GDR attended the UN Conference on the Human Environment in Stockholm. Significantly, the Evangelical Church used its international connections to support an East German delegation which indicated the church's strengthening position vis-a-vis -vis the state in the East. One result of the 1972 Stockholm Conference was the GDR's creation of the Ministry for Environmental Protection and Water Management. This ministry was supposed to manage steps toward environmental protection, and it was created 14 years ahead of a similar move by West Germany, which created its federal office only as a response to the Chernobyl disaster in 1986. Two conflicting interests prevented the GDR's new ministry from having any real impact. While conservationists viewed the GDR's environmental issues as part of an urgent international crisis, economists and party officials were concerned with competitive economic growth and planning. During this time, worsening, a worsening economic situation resulted in East Germany's increasing dependence on West German economic support. This economic relationship had been established in a basic treaty of 1972 between the two German states, which subsequently opened GDR society to some extent to Western consumerism and cultural influence. And it allowed West German journalists to work in and report from the East. In 1973, East Germany was admitted to the United Nations. And in 1975, the GDR joined the third conference on security and cooperation in Europe that took place in Helsinki. The desire for international ties and international recognition posed a risk to the state's heightening security concerns too. As Merrill Jones has pointed out, the GDR's participation in such international forums meant that East Germany had to quote, subject itself to international standards in the areas of human rights, end quote making the highly secretive authoritarian state subject to some international accountability. For, this, for the state, the church could be an important ally in this endeavor. In 1978, Honecker's administration and church leaders met and the church quote, acknowledged the SED's authority and that the church and state had common humanistic goals, end quote. This new relationship meant that the church began to enjoy more autonomy from the state and could likewise extend its privileges of independence and resources to those who sought refuge there. Oppositional groups such as the peace movement, the gay rights movement, the environmental movement, and women's groups all began to meet and organize in local churches throughout the country in the 1970s and 1980s. For these groups, church support ranged from providing meeting rooms, to providing equipment and platforms to print and publish literature independent of the state and its censors. As Julia Alt has argued about the special history behind environmental activism and religion in East Germany, the evangelical church proved a natural ally because it had its own agenda when it came to environmental protection and conservation efforts. In the early 1970s, Church leadership in Magdeburg, Germany used its ecclesiastical research center to conduct research and develop a narrative about the relationship between theology and ecology. The church's own environmental working groups emerged and began publishing literature about ecological problems using ecclesiastical justifications for making interventions, but also organizing community events such as tree plantings and marches. Funneling work through the Ecclesiastical Research Center, the church succeeded in gathering not only theologians, but also scientists, engineers, medical experts, and concerned citizens, especially mothers whose children were suffering from toxic levels of pollution. The evangelical church's international ties were also an incentive for environmental work. In 1979, a conference titled Faith, Science, and the Future was held in Boston, Massachusetts for the World Council of Churches, 
and it had a significant impact on East German evangelical environmental engagement. The state's response to this level of organizing in the church was to offer the same, at least on the surface. In 1980, the state established the Secular Society for Nature and the Environment with the goal of inviting citizens to participate in planning and decision-making efforts outside of the church. The plan was to first pull people away from the church and then, quote, stifle their activities through the state's centralized bureaucratic structure, end quote. The state underestimated people's real concerns, however, and their stalling methods and efforts to contain grassroots organizing ultimately failed. By 1983, environmental groups had emerged in decentralized underground circles throughout the GDR, mostly in the basements of churches. Although the church certainly had a strong environmental program and it offered activists a safe haven to organize and network, there were significant secular influences too. One such example is the sensational Club of Rome publication in 1972, The Limits to Growth. It was a report drafted by an international research group with a dire warning about the environmental and related complications due to human overpopulation. News about this report and eventually copies of the report itself found its way to East German circles via West German radio and person to person contact. Altogether, grassroots environmental organizing formed in individual localized groups called Umweltbibliotheken or environmental libraries. The nuclear reactor disaster at Chernobyl in 1986 served as a catalyst for increased environmental activism and networking culminating in about 100 groups in the GDR. A pillar of the environmental groups was the publication and distribution of illegal pamphlets, such as the so-called Umweltblätter, or environmental pages, which addressed a range of sociopolitical problems from the environment to racism and neo-Nazism to demands for more freedoms. By 1982, the GDR's inability to align economic and environmental policy led the state to classify all data on environmental destruction and related issues. By the time the wall fell in 1989, the GDR was importing more than it was exporting. The national debt was 60% over its annual export earnings and equivalent to a whopping two thirds of the country's annual income. East Germany was unable to address the damage to the environment because of a crippling national deficit, that left industries with outdated technologies, and the state unable to lower production plans. The emphasis on economic growth created a critical gap between policy and practice and caused significant failures in the country's environmental efforts. In the meantime, the series of political, economic, and social changes led the state to consider new containment tactics, including in some strategic cases, making concessions. Okay, before I move on, I wanna show you a second um, short uh, animation from the East German studios in the late 1980s. Oh, 
Okay, um, so again, turning to satire, East German animator Zieglinde Hamacher's three minute short from 1987, The Solution, portrays the power of using civil courage against an authoritarian figure. A flock of birds sits on a telephone wire. When one little bird refuses to face the same direction in the flock as the flock, the leader struggles to find a solution while the rest of the birds anxiously observe the power struggle. Finding that neither violence nor cajoling works, the leader decides his only option is to give the little bird what he wants by turning the entire flock around. By the end of the 1980s, there's evidence that the state was beginning to respond favorably to some demands. Even as the oppositional groups were subjected to heavy state surveillance and the Stasi worked to infiltrate, disrupt and censure their circles. State officials feared that some of the activism would destabilize the regime. As the movements gained momentum under the protection of the church, they networked and grew in strength and citizens started to voice their discontent and make their demands heard. The state had been making concessions for public shows of environmental action since the 1960s, especially the seemingly innocuous events organized by church-based groups, such as tree plantings. Most events aligned with the state's progressive environmental stance and the concessions, quote, diminish the prospect of broad-based protest, end quote. The Stasi had to take care the interventions did not inadvertently lead to more popular support. For example, some of the underground publications gained notoriety and strengthened the groups only after the Stasi attempted to suppress them. When the state closed down a Leipzig underground publication Aufbruch in 1986, other groups rallied and sent money to pay the editor's fines. These were disjointed local uh, local groups that previously hadn't really been connected. In November 1987, the Stasi planned another failed sting operation, Falle, to disrupt production of the underground magazine Grenzfall, a provocative title whose heading was completely unambiguous about bringing about the fall of the Berlin Wall, as you can see from the picture at the heading there and which was re gaining a reach as far as Moscow through underground distribution efforts. It was produced by Initiative for Peace and Human Rights, 
a secular opposition group that was operating at the Berlin Zion Church and which would become a key member of the Alliance 90 political party in the 1990 German elections. The group was informed about the sting and the Stasi operators found members publishing pages for the church's licensed publication instead. The fallout of the failed operation, however, proved extremely beneficial for the opposition who managed to spread the word about the Stasi interference, gaining the group visibility in East and West Germany and elevating awareness of its message about peace, disarmament, democracy, and racial justice. A follow-up Stasi report indicates that by January, 1988, the numbers of participants at church-based events had increased from about 150 to 2,500 visitors as had the number of locations for oppositional meetings spreading from Berlin to about 40 other cities. In 1987, several public and semi-public events took place that attested to the Stasi's concerns that the suppression of activities and information could have adverse effects. In May, a series of Greenpeace talks and the distribution of Greenpeace flyers occurred at the Berlin Umweltbibliothek. In June, an evangelical human rights group submitted an open letter demanding the declassification of data about the effects of lignite mining on both communities and nature in Upper Lusatia. In October, a podium discussion titled Health and Environment in Our City took place at the Hygiene Museum in Dresden and was organized by local and state officials and was open to the public. Attendees asked direct questions and made demands about information related to the environment, such as, Quote, is it known that water contaminated with toxins from the drug factory in Dresden is constantly being dubbed into the Elba River? And why isn't environmental data published like it is in the West? And we don't wanna hear about the history of the art collections. We wanna hear about keeping the water and air clean, end quote. Ultimately, the Stasi agent attending recommends in the report that the state quote, provide quote, a factual answer because if representatives of the state apparatus dodge these questions or prepare such events insufficiently, end quote, that alone would be used to attack the GDR, citing again Western mass media events that, quote, propagate a broad opposition in the GDR, end quote. Suppression, therefore, ran the risk of negative exposure and inadvertently supporting the destabilizing effects of such widespread discontent, both internally to the GDR and from the West. This latter fear was well justified. An important figure in the East-West collaboration was West German journalist Petra Vinsirsky, who I mentioned at the top at the beginning of the lecture. Vinsirsky had been banned from entering East Germany after 1985. However, his reporting on env environmental catastrophes in the East had just started. In 1986, he published his book, Nothing Grows from Top to Bottom, which I quoted from earlier. And that same year, he started a West German show entitled Contrasta, which reported on a range of issues from forest damage to top secret uranium mining and the GDR's classification of data. In 1988, the East German environmental group Arsha is formed upon the momentum of the Stasi's failed sting operation. And it was formed in an effort to, look, to network local environmental groups more, sufficient, more efficiently throughout the GDR. Uh, Arsha began to smuggle illegally filmed uh, filmed video footage of environmental destruction to Vensirsky in the West. For example, their raw footage of the chemical pollution to land and water in Bitterfeld was screened in private circles in the GDR before making it across the border to Vensirsky, who used it for an episode on his show titled Bitterus aus Bitterfeld, and which was also shown on several Western stations. And it's important to note that 80% of an estimated 80% of East Germans could access West German television. The Stasi was unable to prevent the continued negative exposure. While this international cooperation between activist circles and Western actors was an important aspect of the momentum of the environmental movement in the East, there was a momentum building culturally as well, which was quite open and often legitimated by the state. A number of books and films were being produced and released to the public in some form. We have seen two of the animation shorts, which were screened at international film festivals, including 
having both having pr premieres at the Leipzig International Film Festival in the GDR. Uh, Monica Maron's 1981 book, Flight of Ashes, is about a journalist reporting on the poisonous effects of coal mining in Bitterfeld, and it's based on her experiences as an East German journalist reporting on chemical pollution in the GDR and the censorship that she encountered in her work. Ultimately, the, the novel was published in the West, but she was provided 100 copies to distribute in the East. Christa Wolf's 1987 best-selling novel, Accident, A Day's News, centers on the nuclear disaster at Chernobyl to reflect on citizens' concerns about the effects of highly secretive government and scientific decisions on the personal lives of citizens. Kurt Tetzloff's award-winning documentary, Memory of a Landscape, or Memories of a Landscape, uh, was a moving comment on the loss of community and nature due to the spread of open pit mining. And there was also a documentary trilogy by Petra Wolcha about the heavy impact of lignite mining in Lusatia that was made between 1987 and 1990. In 1989, two feature films were well, were well underway. Jörg Fott's uh, film Biology, which came out in 1990, was an adaptation of Wolf Spilner's novella Wasser Amsel. And it was about a teenage activist who uses dubious means to stop the construction of a private home in a conservation area. Rolf Lozanski's Farewell Disco from 1989 was about brown coal mining. The films that were made and premiered during this tumultuous 1989-1990 period offer sharp critiques of a society that was vanishing before their eyes. As film historian Mary Elizabeth O'Brien has said about these socially critical films of this distinct point in time, they were not films, quote, about the present, but a history film about the recent past, end quote. Filmmaker Peta Kahana of this generation of filmmakers shared, quote, we wanted to call things what they were, to show a departure and experience the whole misery of people who were cheated out of one of the most important things, their hopes and the absurdity of a political system which did not let its own people become active and because of that had to collapse, end quote. There are many explanations for the fall of the Berlin Wall, the dissolution of the Soviet Union and the end of the Cold War in Europe, from economic collapse to an uncertain political climate such as um, glasnost and perestroika in the Soviet Union to social unrest. They were all well studied and documented and not entirely unrelated as we have seen here. The economic crisis intersected with the environmental catastrophe and people rallied against the limitations to freedom and information and shared international interests in denuclearization, environmentalism, peace and human rights, all of which had been growing rapidly since the 1960s. These social movements emerged in East Germany and the Soviet bloc because the problems existed there as well. And many of the problems, such as the effects of acid rain and the fallout from the nuclear disaster in Chernobyl, paid no heed to political lines and fortified borders. The inability technologically, politically, and economically to completely separate East from West came to a climax in 1989. When Hungary opened its border to Austria in June 1989, thousands of East Germans sought ways to leave the country for the West. In the fall, grassroots mobilization moved from autonomous indoor spaces, such as the churches, to the streets. Large demonstrations started to take place in cities across East Germany, demanding freedom of speech and the right to peaceably assemble. When Egon Krenz replaced Erich Honecker on October 18th, the new administration was mired by an impossible national deficit and a mounting push for social change. The Berlin Wall fell on November 9th, 1989 to peaceful protest. <clears throat> Since the fall of the Berlin Wall, environmental recovery has played a significant role in the economic, political, and sociocultural negotiations of reuniting the, reuniting the two countries and planning for the future. I will briefly discuss the successes and challenges of Germany's energy policy since 1990 in order to reflect on some lessons learned. As I mentioned earlier, the Initiative for Peace and Human Rights was a secular oppositional group that gained a lot of traction in the last years of the GDR, 
and which was a key player in the Alliance 90 political party that formed between three social movements after the fall of the Berlin Wall, including Democracy Now! and New Forum. In the 1990 federal elections, Alliance 90 won eight East German seats in the new German parliament. And in 1993, it formed a successful coalition with the Green parties in East and West Germany to secure parliamentary seats for the Greens. Their environmental and social justice platform has been influential on both policy and public opinion in Germany ever since. An early example of this influence is how the Green Party was able to build on the renewable energy feed-in laws first introduced after Chernobyl in 1986 and which were adopted in 1990. <coughs> and they signify Germany's aggressive turn to renewable energy that gained momentum after the Green Party gained, its, gained seats in parliament in 1993. The electricity feed-in law set tariffs that required suppliers to pay a fixed price for every kilowatt hour of renewable energy that was fed into the grid. While the tariffs have successfully sub subsidized the increased production of renewable energy sources, the increased costs were passed on directly to consumers. The 2000 Renewable Energy Sources Act replaced the 1990 law and has been revisited numerous times, but it maintained the substantial tariff system that allowed prices to be set by policymakers, and it proved remarkably infl inflexible for a changing market. Between 2000 and 2013, the price of electricity doubled for the average German household. In the years 2014 to 2016, record levels of clean energy were generated in Germany. And with such unprecedented growth rates, the tariffs were lowered in 2015, but not enough. In 2016, an auction system was introduced versus the tariffs, instead of the tariffs. And it was a way to determine rates through a more free market approach versus having rates set by lawmakers. And this so far has lowered costs for consumers. And at this point now, people are waiting to see how well this works moving forward. In addition to a significant increase in renewable energy and lower greenhouse gas emissions, two other goals of Germany's Energiewende are to phase out nuclear power by 2022. And they are on track, I believe, to close the last two nuclear power plants by the end of this year. And to inspire and maintain widespread public support and participation. In 2000, the government signed a phase out agreement with the energy industry. The impetus behind this was the SPD Green Party ruling coalition government at that time, of, of, at 2000. But in 2010, the next administration led by Angela Merkel extended the nuclear phase out plan in order to realize the ambitious plans to lower greenhouse gas emissions 80% by 2050. This decision is because nuclear power is virtually carbon free. When the Fukushima nuclear disaster happened in 2011, Merkel's Merkel's administration responded to the widespread anti-nuclear protests that erupted and she reversed course. The government set the 2022 nuclear phase out date while keeping the 2050 goal. This means of course that the country continues to rely, rely on coal and energy imports to compensate for the intermittent generation of renewable energy sources. The result, industry expert, Dr. Christina Storm found some troubling figures. First, the 2050 goal of 80% reductions in greenhouse gases seems out of reach with Germany continuing to burn coal um, versus another source um, that seems out of reach. And two, the sweeping changes to the power sector have not contributed significantly to lower emissions. At least half of Germany's 27% decrease since 1990 happened before any of the energy vendor policies were implemented. At the start of this talk, I shared the findings of climate journalist Umir Irfan, who has reported that Germany's CO2 emissions fell 15% after reunification. A large contribution to this was the shuttering of East German power plants, as well as updates to running power plants and falling population numbers. 
On the other hand, the popularity of Germany's Energiewende demonstrates the results of powerful environmental groups and grassroots mobilization of ordinary citizens to demand reform, model sustainable practices, and send an urgent message of conservation and protection. It has also succeeded in feeding in renewable energy sources at a remarkably high rate. So what have we learned? To conclude, I'll introduce three threads that I find running through this history of crisis and recovery that we can take away as some lessons. Thread one, the exertion of political, the quote, exertion of political influence, end quote, is a key component of the energy venda. But too much political interference has had a deleterious effect on policy and society. Political interference is often profit driven, especially when it comes to climate policy. In East Germany, this was done ultimately to protect the needs of the socialist planned economy. More recently, the unreasonably high energy costs were only mitigated when the auction system was introduced to replace the tariffs imposed by lawmakers in order to subsidize the generation of renewable energy and to protect export industries from incurring high energy costs due to the, to the transition. The hope is that the lower costs will make it more equitable as well, earning more support. Thread two is that broad public support and participation is crucial to climate policy success. The, su the suppression of information and participation in East Germany simply resulted in short-term stability. For the energy vendor, citizen participation has been critical to its viability as a policy experiment. This includes developing individual behaviors and practices that are sustainable, that generate broad policy support, and it includes cost sharing. This is achieved through transparency and the cooperation of government, institutions, and citizens. This is alter pa pa also Peter Wenzierski's message in his sensational publication, Nothing Grows from Top to Bottom. The title is a quote by the Protestant theologian Heino Falke, who is known for using his position in the church to challenge the East German state. Wenzierski explains that, quote, consternation and concern can only arise from information, which then leads to responsible commitment, end quote. Thread three, international cooperation is crucial not only because the climate crisis is global, but because solutions to the power grid problems will likely be found through cooperation between neighboring states. And as we saw in the history of East Germany, the different perspective and accountability that comes through international cooperation can inspire progressive policy decisions. If economic policy and political partisanship drive environmental climate and climate policy from above, what drives it from below? Looking at the examples of former East Germany from 1970s and then to today, this talk has examined how former East Germans engaged the depths of their environmental crisis and its impact on individuals and communities to organize and work in order to bring about change. Protesters in 1989 wanted to reform socialism through a variety of claims against the state that demanded the German Democratic Republic live up to its name and that socialist ideology indeed work for the people. Peace activists wanted demilitarization and denuclearization Environmental activists shared the concerns of the peace movement, and they also wanted transparency about the GDR's environmental crisis and collective action to address it. Ordinary citizens wanted more freedoms, including the right to assembly. Everyone wanted a say. The end of communism in Germany and reunification with the West may have been more than people bargained for. But one thing is for sure, there is a general consensus among the population today about the need to address the climate crisis as not only an economic or political issue, but a moral issue as well. As the country moves forward, there are valuable lessons in there to be learned. Okay. And that is the end of my talk. Thank you. This is a picture from the archives that, of graffiti on the wall on the Western side. Um, that says we'd rather have the wall die than the, the forests. <laughs> Victoria, thank you so much for just a brilliant and generative talk. Um, I'm, I'm sure we'd all agree. Uh, we have time available for questions. 
Is it, is it all right if I, if I start us off then? Yeah. yeah, so I'm really interested um, in this dynamic of data in the aesthetic that's going on here, because you know what I'm thinking about contemporary visual culture that's engaged with environmental degradation and climate change, right? It tends to be data rich. Like I'm thinking of like Andrea Pauli's work where it's like real time climate data is projected on buildings, for instance. Um, but in the East German context, right, um, it's uh, the state managed withdrawal of, of data um, that's at play. Um, and there's, I think there's an interesting sort of dynamic that's at play there with the Stasi, right? Because it's a question of like who sees what and why. So it's a really sort of enriched uh, visual and non-visual zone. Um, but within this kind of apparatic space where environmental data is withdrawn, um, some of the most powerful aesthetic work that I've seen, you know, in a long time has been these animations you've shown. So yeah, I'm just interested in how you've thought about the sort of relationship between aesthetics and the absence of data. And I guess really basically like why animation? Um, well, the, um, I'll start with the last. <laughs> question and Ani the animation studios could do satire and things like that in a way that like the feature film studios was unable to do um uh i don't think the animations got as widespread of a viewing um but the animators and um were able to do more with that and um increasingly these short animations were targeted at adult audiences. So you get that kind of satire um, is there. And you know, a lot of this, the, what was produced along those lines depended on the era in which it was produced. Cause there were periods of um, the, in the GDR of, of crackdowns when something like that never could have happened. And then periods of um, things loosening up when they could. And so because of like this, history that I kind of outlined about the uh, the fears of the effects of the you know destabilizing the regime um they were trying to allow more things like that to, uh, to appear and not crack down so so harshly um <clears throat> this it wasn't just something in going on in like the environmental movement as well other other social movement uh, social movements experience this kind of uh, leniency from the state and this attempt to make concessions on their demands. So um, it was it was just kind of the zeitgeist, I guess, like what was going on in the 1980s for that. So as far as and this combination of data and the missing data from the East and the visual culture, um, it's one of the things that um, as I mean, <laughs> I mean, we, you and I were talking a little bit before this that I think that my talk today very much shows that this is a new project for me and I've done a lot of like gathering of information um, and getting my facts straight, but, but um, this, the, what, what I take away from it is that like, A, like things were so bad that even if the data was missing, you could see the devastation. It, it, it that you know especially if you lived in one of these sectors it was no secret and then this this collaboration um between social movements and this collaboration across the border worked to fill in those gaps of what the stasi was withholding so um to get these images out on video and peter vensierski's book you know he 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 did accomplish a lot in the GDR as, as a correspondent from the West before he was banned from coming back into the country. And his book from Nothing Grows from Top to Bottom is full of information, it, uh, full of data and things that he would, had managed to uncover. So um, there was this exchange of information that did pass across the border um, via these underground circles. And also, like I said, you know, like if, if it showed up on West German television, there was a huge chance that most East Germans could see it. So, um, <clears throat> so it was just a circular roundabout kind of way of trying to fill in these gaps. But, but the, 
visual culture, the animations, um, the books, um, all those things, they, they're just responding to what's going, what's actually going on, you know. Thank you. I have like a million and one follow-ups that I, I could ask, but uh, yeah, Question, questions from, from others. Hey, yeah. Um, first of all, thank you for this. I mean, um, I was amazed at your ability to take the complexity of those histories and present them, you know, <laughs> in, in, in that timeline. Um, and I, I, there were two things. These are more comments, really. One, I was glad you, you extended it, you know, um, after unification and then looked kind of what's going on kind of today-ish, you know, in the last uh, 20, certainly 10 years. But particularly, you know, given the Ukraine situation, I think this story that you're telling is incredibly vital, right? Because of these, like, the many um, uh, different routes available to Germany right now, or many different options, some foreclosed and some opened up. Yeah. And it seems like a really vital time to uh, review that history. So I'm wondering how you see seeing that history in light of today. Um, I mean, I have read some current news articles, you know, about the push to move the 2050 date up to even 2035. Um, I didn't I didn't include that because like the, the 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 information I did give you were peer you know kind of gone over by several peer reviewed um, studies about the efficacy of the energy vendor. So these new ideas that politicians are putting out, and like, whoa, no, we're we're generating so much renewable energy, we can bump it up from 2050 to 2035. Yes, this is a response to the crisis in Ukraine, it's not really been validated yet, though I don't think by scientists. But what's interesting about that is that it's not just in Germany now, this talk about getting off of foreign oil and Russia's natural gas, like it's, there's this scramble everywhere to do this. And it's like this, this terrible war has managed to do in a couple months what climate policy advocates and lawmakers have not managed to do in decades as far as rallying uh, opinion and a common sense of urgency that this has to be done and it has to be done now. So it will be interesting to watch, you know, if Germany is able to, to move from 2050 to 2035. I know, you know, the huge problem is that <clears throat> that they decided to shut or, to close their nuclear power plants before they decided to close their coal power plants. And this has to do with the long history of the Green Party in, in, in Germany. And um, also the Cold War and the, the real anxieties that there were about, about nuclear technology. So, um, I mean, this is decades and decades of fear and anxieties. So, you know, when Fukushima happens, all the memories resurface of Chernobyl, and um, it's, it just doesn't become possible culturally and socially to keep nuclear power as an option in Germany and use that as a bridging technology instead of coal. But um, that's created a real problem for Germany because they have to run their coal power plants. And uh, now it's not really possible since 2022 was the year to close the, the nuclear power plants. It's not possible to put those back online just because now there's a war in Ukraine and Germany needs to get off of its dependency of Russian uh, resources. So um, I think a lot of things are up in the air. I think it's incredibly timely. I think that there's probably a lot of scientific teams scrambling to see if this is even viable. And I'm kind of interested to see, but as I kind of came to in my talk is that it's remarkable that the, before the war in Ukraine, when there was just a general consensus, even outside of Germany, within Germany, 
there's broad public support for this, you know, to be um, 80% carbon neutral by 2050, even though German, Germans themselves are footing the bill. It can't go to the industries because that would hurt their economy. So it has to be the Germans who foot the bills. But they, that, that broad public support doesn't really diminish. And that's, you know, <laughs> that's remarkable. Great. Yeah, thank, thanks so much. I mean, yeah, there's a lot there. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Perhaps, perhaps one more question. <laughs> or with that, I mean, you've given us so much to think about um, with, with your response to Ron's question, Victoria. Um, yeah, I think that um, a good uh, and uh, timely uh, and critical uh, note for us to end our conversation. Okay. So yeah, thank you so much uh, for your